Good morning. I'd like to welcome you to another edition of our Anchored in the Word Morning Reflection. And uh, today, Lord willing, we're going to finish out the section that we've been looking at this week and that we uh, looked at on Sunday morning. And so if you have your Bible, let's turn together to Luke chapter 8, and I'm going to read verses 16 through 21 with you. And then we're going to dig into this passage of Scripture uh, to look at really one final thought that I, I hope will be very encouraging. Here's what it says. No man, when he hath lighted a candle, covereth it with a vessel, or putteth it under a bed, but setteth it on a candlestick, that they which enter in may see the light. For nothing is secret that shall not be made manifest, neither anything that shall not be made known abroad. Take heed, therefore, how ye hear. Whosoever hath, to him shall be given. Whosoever hath not, from him shall be taken, even that which he seemeth to have. Then came to him his mother and his brethren, and could not come at him for the press, And it was told him by certain which said, Thy mother and thy brethren stand without desiring to see thee. He answered and said unto them, My mother and my brethren are these which hear the word of God and do it. Now, throughout this passage, we have been looking at how each of these pieces have been connected together. And ultimately, what this text is about is taking heed how we hear the truth. And so, when we looked at these verses, we saw the importance of recognizing that we are light. And when we have responded to the gospel and the word of God is working in us, uh, we have that distinct quality of being light. And God uses us to draw people to himself so that questions can be asked and the gospel can be presented. And then we move from there into the concept that there is nothing secret that's not going to be revealed. And so he emphasizes the judgment, the fact that we're going to one day stand before God. And the only thing that's going to help a person to be able to escape God's ultimate eternal condemnation is the gospel. And so those who respond to the gospel are those who are able to escape that terrible judgment. And then from that, we moved into... Uh, Another important topic in talking about how we hear the Word of God and how if a person is responding correctly to the Word of God, more information is given to them, and a person who rejects the Word of God, they're going to lose opportunity. And so we talked about the fact that our our, our fellowship with God, not our position, but our fellowship with God is something that can be strengthened. It's something that we can grow in, and there's a, a greater depth of fellowship and communion that is available to us as we respond properly to the Word of God. Well, this morning, what I'd like us to do is focus in on this last little piece that is fascinating because it's a situation that uh, that Jesus encountered in other parts of the Gospels. And so, if you look down in verses 19 through 21, it says that at this time, his mother and his brethren came to him and could not come at him for the press. And it was told him by certain which said, Thy mother and thy brethren stand without desiring to see thee. He answered and said, My my mother and my brethren are they which hear the word of God and do it. Now, I want you to put yourself in the situation of Christ here. I mean, think about when I was in high school. Maybe I was at a ball game, like a wrestling tournament or a baseball game or basketball game. And I'm there talking with my friends and my mother comes into the game and she's she's there with my siblings. And uh, one of my friends says, Hey, Joel, your mom's here. She wants to talk to you. There's no way in the world that I would have said, well, I'm busy right now. I don't have time to talk to mom. (laughs) I would have put everything down and I would have said, okay, where is she? Let's go talk to her. Why is that? was well, because of the priority that you put on your mother. This is someone who uh, has, has fed you, has clothed you, uh, ultimately uh, cared for you from the time you were a little child. And a lot of what you have in life is a result of your mother's care. And I know not everyone has uh, had a mother who cares for them like that, but Jesus' mother was a good woman. Uh, she was someone who took care of him. And so you would expect him to honor his mother. Even though he's an adult, he would honor his mother. And his siblings are people... Obviously, these are not his biological siblings. These are these are half siblings because Jesus had no biological father. But at the same time, you'd say, well, that that family bond, that family connection, is very very important. So that the pauses us, uh, causes us to pause and ask this question: Was was Jesus being disrespectful to his mother? Was he saying he didn't value her? He didn't value his uh, his his mother's children? And the answer is that's really not what Jesus is doing. He's, he's looking at a very particular scenario where he's showing his priorities. And this gets into a very important topic that I think is a part of when people respond to the word correctly, what they begin to prioritize in their lives. And so let me, be, let me kind of pause for a moment by stating a couple things I think are important on this topic. 
when we talk about the family, God is the one who created family. God is the one who instituted marriage. God's the one who created male and female. And God's the one who, who commands us to leave father and mother, cleave to our wife. We become one flesh. And that's a bond that's not supposed to be separated by anything but death. Okay? That's God's plan. And God's plan is good, and it is for our good. And if a society is going to be strong, then marriage has to be honored. And I'll even go on beyond go, go beyond to say this. In a family where people honor God and they embrace the truth, the potential for unity and the sweetness of that family is strengthened, it's heightened, because those people are prioritizing God first. And because they prioritize God first as a group, what ends up happening as a byproduct is that their bonds with one another are strengthened. So it is through their walk with God that their marriage is strengthened, their relationship with their siblings is strengthened, the relationship between parent and child and child and parent are strengthened. And so that's the ideal scenario. That's what a godly home looks like. But that's not how every single family operates. In a fallen world, there are some families where a person becomes a Christian at, after they've been married. And so they're now married to an unbeliever and they were an unbeliever before and now uh, they have a very complicated situation. Or uh, maybe they get, mar- they get saved later in life and uh, their children are already past those formative years and they've, they've already grown. They, they even have their own children. And so what happens is that when a person becomes a Christian later in life, that means that they're going to have some potential conflicts or potential challenges that are a result of that, especially if when that person becomes a Christian, their family members become antagonistic to the gospel. In other words, a child might become antagonistic towards their parents or a spouse might become antagonistic towards their spouse or whatever the scenario. These are things that can potentially happen in a fallen world. And so the question that we need to ask ourselves is in a scenario where a person now has this conflict of interest and this conflict of allegiance, where are they supposed to put the priority? Are they supposed to put the priority on their husband or their wife or their parent or their child or on God himself? Well, the answer is found in Luke chapter 14, verse 26. This is what it says. It says, if any man will come to me, and hate not his father and his mother and his wife and his children and his brethren and his sisters, yea, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. Now, Jesus is not suggesting that we're supposed to have animosity towards family members or that we're not supposed to take care of our body or that it's okay to harbor bitterness and resentment or it's okay for a child to be disobedient and disrespectful to their parent. That is not what Jesus is suggesting. He has a very narrow focus in this particular passage. He's talking about matters of allegiance. And so if you have a scenario where a family member says, it's either me or it's your Christian faith, guess what? You have a responsibility, an obligation to put God first. It's not that you're trying to isolate yourself from family. Absolutely not. You want to live out uh, the power of the gospel in front of your family. You want them to see the distinction and the difference. And by the way, in the New Testament, in in the epistles, there are several examples of the Apostle Paul answering questions, well, what happens when you have a person who uh, becomes a Christian after they've been a, you know, a married or family situation, whatever the situation is? And he says, be content to live within the context that you're given, but recognize that sometimes there can be an allegiance conflict. And in that situation, God is supreme. He's number one. So I could put it like this. We are to love our spouse. We're to honor our parents. We're to nurture our children. And what we do is we love God first. And it is by loving God first that we can love our spouse properly. It's by loving God first that we can honor our parents properly, by loving God first, that we're able to nurture our children appropriately. And so God takes the priority. He is number one in our lives as Christians. And so that's really an important principle for us to consider because it actually has a little bit of bearing on what's going on here. 
Ultimately, what's happening is Jesus is ministering to people. He's preaching the word. He's teaching the word. He's answering their questions. They're pressing on close to him because they're interested in what he's saying. They want to know the truth. And there's his mother and there's his brethren. And they're saying, hey, Jesus, you're neglecting us. We need to talk to you. We need to see you. And what Jesus is ultimately saying is, not that I don't love my mother and not that I don't honor my mother and not that my brethren are unimportant to me, but when it comes to priority, my priority is not mom, it's God. It's not my siblings, it's God. The people that are gathered together are here to hear the word of God. And that at the moment is my priority. And by the way, we have to be careful. I think sometimes people take a principle like this and they will misapply it. They will actually ignore their family duties. They'll ignore their uh, the, the need to nurture their children. Say, oh, I, I'm putting the ministry first and I'm, I'm ignoring my children because God will take care of them. That's not what we're talking about here. Your, your ministry is your wife and your children in a Christian home, okay? Even before the church and those other things. But we're talking about a misplaced allegiance, a conflict between those issues. Jesus says, my priority is the work that God's given me to do. But then that leads us to another principle that's extremely important. And that is that when a person becomes a Christian, God places them into this body that is an additional family. And, and, and I will say even a family that has greater potential for connection and relationship than what the biological connection can bring. There's a, no question that you have a, a warmth and affection naturally for those who are in your family. I know that families have their squabbles and their differences, okay? But that biological bond is very strong and it's very powerful. But the connection that is available to people who are bonded together because of the gospel is potentially far more important. The fact is that we will spend eternity with one another forever because of the gospel. And so he talks about what is gained when someone becomes a Christian that could be potentially lost because of the conflicts that could come in some home situations. Ephesians 2.19 says that we are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. Powerful statement. We are a part of God's household. Romans chapter 8, verse 16. He says, you've received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father, the spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs and heirs of God and join heirs with Christ. I could go to lots and lots of other scriptures that talk about this principle. But when a person becomes a Christian, they're not just saved from their sins and have an eternal destination in heaven, but they are placed into a family. And that's what the church is supposed to be. It's supposed to be the sweetest uh, place that you could ever imagine, a place where people are united together because of the gospel. I think about when we celebrate communion. We remember the Lord's table. We take the bread and we take the juice and we eat it and we drink it as a body because we're remembering not only what Christ did for us as individuals, but we're remembering corporately what he's done for us as a body and has placed us together. So this is a very powerful truth, something that is really worth spending a lot of time reflecting on. So here's the question. How do we apply this passage? Let me give you some very simple thoughts to close out. It really comes down to one of two things. Everything rises and falls on how we respond to the word of God. Either one, I'm going to reject the word or I'm going to embrace the word. And so if I reject the word, I'm going to do it to my own detriment. The consequences are very, very serious. I'm going to be conformed to a system that is broken, that's opposed to God, that's in rebellion to him, that's ultimately passing away. And the purposes that I'm going to live for are going to fall flat. I'm going to stumble around in spiritual darkness and blindness. And, and, and ultimately what's going to happen is I'm going to stand before God someday. I'm going to give an account for all the sins I've ever committed. And I'm going to be condemned eternally, isolated from my creator. That's the one side. Reject the gospel, reject the truth and you do it to your detriment. On the other side, there's the, the response of embracing the truth. If I embrace the gospel and I embrace the implications of the gospel, the, the things that are taught after that, what it does is it frees me. 
The truth will set you free so that you can pour your life into something that has eternal significance and eternal value. You have something that can never be taken away from you. You have a noble purpose that is given to you and you can live for something that has eternal value. You can live in a way that's consistent with the design that God has for you as a person. A distinctive walk that points people to the truth, freedom from fear of in- eternal condemnation, an intimate walk with God that just grows progressively as we mature in the faith, an everlasting family. And so the question is, which one do you want? <laughs> do you want the first or the second? It all rises and falls on what you do at Scripture. As we look at this passage, Luke chapter 8, verses 16 through 21, we've been reminded that we need to take heed how we hear the truth. It's so very important. I hope that this will be an encouragement to you as you uh, get ready to close out the week. Lord willing, tomorrow uh, we are going to do one more episode, not in Luke chapter 8, but it's going to uh, be dealing with what we talk about on Wednesday. And so uh, if you could, uh, I hope that you'll, you'll check out that bonus episode, which uh, will be very practical and very, very helpful. Have a great rest of your day, and Lord willing, uh, we will meet you tomorrow morning. Bye now.